Uh, Delia Despair, as she's known to her many blog fans, survived a turbulent, if privileged, childhood as the daughter of a globe-trotting diplomat and was blessed or cursed with a, a confusion of mums and a string of convents and smart schools before attending a Swiss business school. Uh, she even managed to become a journalist on the Daily Telegraph. Quite a life. Uh, she's got it all in a book called The Grown-Ups Wouldn't Like It. Uh, let's welcome to the show Delia Despair. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, just the name's fantastic. It just makes me break out into a bit of a chuckle, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. Um, let's start with your childhood, which I have to say, what happened when you were very young for the first five years of your life was really quite extraordinary. It sounds like a made-up story. So tell, <laughs> tell us how you ended up um, with your mum disappearing to Nigeria. Well, my mother didn't know what to do with me because I was six months and she met this woman on the beach in Hove and said, I, I've got this little baby, I don't know what to do with her. And this woman said, oh, well, I'll look after her for you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happened. I'm, I'm, I'm horrified and impressed in equal measure by that. Um, <laughs> when you say your mother didn't know what to do with you, uh, why did she have you then? If you <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> well, because Nigeria was a very dangerous country for children at that time. Right. It was known as White Man's Grave. Yep. And um, so obviously she couldn't take me there. No, no children went there. And um, so she... She wanted to co go to see her husband, obviously. Right. And I was in the way, and my sister as well. Wow. She was five. And um, the people who went on the beach all knew each other at, at that time. Yeah. Well, th actually, they didn't, but we became friends with people who went on the beach. And um, she just met this woman. She hadn't met her before. That's where she met her. <laughs> Started chatting. <laughs> thought she was nice. Uh, and this woman... Joan Priestley, her name was. Yeah. She had some other children there. There were two boys, James and Richard Vandenberg, and a little boy called Dermot, and her own son. And um, then um, my sister and I joined them. I'm not sure you'd get away with that now without being carted <laughs> off by social services, surely. Well, maybe uh, today you would. I don't know. But I, I had a very, very happy childhood with her, and it was great. How extraordinary. <laughs> uh, and so your mum went to Nigeria, and that was, what, for what, five years? Yeah. Well, she came back in between, but they never... I was based in Hove with Joan Priestley for five years, yeah. And she would come back, and I wasn't sure who she was, so I had all <laughs> these different mummies. I called Joan Priestley my red mummy, my mother was my blue mummy, <sighs> and there were another couple of women who were friends of Joan's, who was a... One was a green mummy and one was a white mummy, I think. Good Lord! Because <laughs> I didn't know really who she was. <laughs> I'm, I'm gobsmacked. How did that affect you? I mean, uh, clearly not too terribly, because you're here talking to us now and you sound quite coherent and together, but for a lot of people that would destroy them. <laughs> yeah, and I, I just accepted it, because when you're very young, you do mm, accept things. Yeah, you yeah. just take it for granted. I said, well, yeah, I suppose so. Uh, and so you, your mum came back eventually, and she then took you back again, I, I'm assuming. Well, I mean... Um, what happened was that she kept going back to Nigeria. So after the first five years, we, we tended to go to my grandmother's house in Surbiton. Yes. But, but we sort of go backwards and forwards a bit. And then we went up to Yorkshire because it was the war and it was dangerous. Mm. Um, and we would seem to be all over the place, really, but not in Nigeria. No. And I didn't... When my father came back, I didn't, I didn't like him at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought, who's... Who's this man walking into my mother's bedroom and why are they closing the door? I thought oh, it was all very strange. Oh, funny. <laughs> uh, and so your father was a diplomat? Well, he was... Um, actually, he was... A, a, well, he was called a diplomat by the editor of the publisher. Oh. But he was basically um, in the colonial service. He was an administrator. <laughs> right, OK. So, so, yes, not quite a diplomat in that case, then. Not quite. No. So were you then dragged all over the place by him and your mother? Not really, no, because he didn't... Well, he didn't really like children anyway. 
Well, it sounds um, like the feeling was mutual, so that must have worked out quite well. <laughs> it did work out all right. He, he found me very irritating <laughs> and very argumentative, and I thought the same about him. Um, I was never allowed my own opinions. It was always had to be his opinion. He kept saying, you are the most argumentative person I've ever met. Oh, and, you know, he'd always, and I'd say, well, why can't I have a different opinion from you? And he'd say, because you're wrong, Delia, you're wrong. Oh, funny. <laughs> uh, did your sister share the same view of your father? I think she did, really, because I remember my father once wanting to put me on his lap. I was about four, and I remember I didn't want to be on his lap, and she tried to pull me off as well. I don't think either of us liked him that much. Crikey. <clears throat> that's, a com- have... that's a complex relationship, to be fair. Yeah. I mean, we, we loved our mother very much. Despite the fact she gave you away to a woman that's, on a beach in Hove. That's right, that's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. <Jeez. laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. It's, it, you can't make it up, really. Uh, uh, so then you ended up going off to a string of convents. Um, well, so... one convent. Oh, OK. One convent. Oh, first of all, there was a school that... Camilla Parker Bowles went to oh, it. Oh, really? Yeah. I thought that was awful. Hated that. Because mm. there was a horrible teacher. We weren't allowed to go to the lavatory except in the break in the middle oh, of the morning. And there was only one lavatory, and all the little boys got there in the ten minutes. And you weren't allowed to ask. I was desperate to go oh. to the loo. I was six, I think. And eventually I said, can I be excused? And it was too late. I wet my knickers. Oh, no. And um, they tied, a, this horrible woman tied a red band on my chair. I remember going home with two other girls and they said, have you heard the story about the little girl who couldn't wait? And I went home and I said to my mother, I'm never going back to that school again. How and awful. She, she was all. It was quite cruel. And apparently lots of people wet the floor. And then... I don't know what happened, but it did have an effect on, on me. Yeah. On my life. Yeah. I bet it did. And, yeah. uh, do you know, it's funny you mentioned that. I mean, I didn't have that experience at school, but did you have that awful toilet paper called Izal? Oh, yes. Wasn't awful. that, wasn't, I mean, who invented that toilet paper and thought it was a good idea? I God, God knows. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it was awful. <laughs> now, you ended up at Rodine. Yeah. Not bad. Not bad, but I, did, I was very, very homesick. Mm. To start with, um, I really hated it, and I used to draw. We were, we were sent up to Keswick at the beginning because it was the war, and um, this is in the Lake District, right? Yeah, yeah. I had yeah. two terms there, <clears throat> and I absolutely hated it. I was so homesick, and we had a horrible school matron. I remember, who uh, if she didn't like you, you had you were in trouble. And there was another little girl from Leeds, and she was equally homesick, and this horrible matron. She was just so horrible. And Jane, who lived in Leeds, ran away and uh, she was caught by Wally at Carlisle, which was about 10 miles away. I remember her being brought back. She had a handkerchief on a stick like Dick Whittington. Mm. And the matron said, this is what I found at Carlisle. (laughs) And uh, poor Jane was put in the sick room for a week in the dark. And I used to visit her. And then... And then after Jane ran away again and got away, I was then picked on by this horrible matron, and I was stuck in the sick room for a week in the dark. I had earache, and she was quite cruel. Didn't have much luck with schools, really, did you? Well, not at that time. No. Um, then, then we went back to Brighton, and it was a bit better. I think matrons have so much power in a girls' boarding school. Mm. You've got to... If you don't hit it off with them, you, they can make your life miserable. Sure. And uh, anyway, then I sort of grad. I think I quite liked it when I got to the sixth form, but by that time I was it was too late because we wanted to leave anyway. Mm. And we, uh, we used to think the outside world we called civilization. Um, you know, to see the bus going past Rodine, we think, oh, it's going into civilization. Why can't we go too? Aww. Because it, we just didn't like it that much. And you ended up in a Swiss business school. Yeah, well, it was um, a... Um, I suppose it was. I, we learnt shorthand typing. No, not typing. We learnt bookkeeping. Not shorthand, sorry, that's two mm-hmm. years later. Um, it, most of the other people in the school were Swiss Germans... And they wanted to do have technical degrees. I wanted to go to the university, but my father wouldn't pay for me to stay longer than five months. 
so they wouldn't take me. So that's why I went to this other school. I see. But I love being in Switzerland. Uh, and and lots uh, of friends. Later in life, not much later in life, you became an au pair to someone you describe as a monstrous woman. I was a governess, not an au pair. Mm. She was a monstrous woman. She was so awful, you wouldn't believe it. Um, so women, yeah. in your, women in your life have, have, have been a real feature, haven't they? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, the, the editor of the Daily Telegraph was a bit fearsome, too. Oh, funny. Yes. Uh, and I also believe you had an encounter with, with uh, some, some fairly important people, uh, for example, Noel Coward and John Gielgud, and you didn't, right. you didn't like John Gielgud either. No, I didn't like him, but I loved Noel Coward. <laughs> well, John Gielgud was a very cold man. Really? And he wasn't very interested in people, quite the opposite to Noel Coward, who loved people. Mm. And um, I got a boyfriend out in Jamaica. Well, it wasn't really a boyfriend. I didn't know him very long. But anyway, he said, I know Noel Coward. I'll introduce you. So he did. And um, Noel Coward talked to us for about half an hour. And then I met him again. In, uh, when I later on I was working at Manchester Airport and he was going through, I had to check him in for a flight to Paris. And Noel Card never expected a great retinue of people. He was a very mm. simple man. And I said to him, do you remember a party on New Year's Eve in Jamaica? And he said, do I not? <laughs> and uh, he wrote in his book, he'd been to an extraordinary party on New Year's Eve with some locals and, and he said our hostess was a bit obviously mad and a bit pissed. <laughs> <laughs> and she was, she, was, um, uh, she was one of those people who should never look as if you were enjoying yourself. You always had to stop it. But she was what you call that type of person. Anyway, <clears throat> so I stayed with her for the time that she went out to Jamaica. She'd run off with this millionaire she'd met in the south of France. And she had loads of money. And she treated the servants terribly badly and me worse i think Good they, Lord. they they were more upset when she was angry with me than when she was angry with them uh, and am i correct in uh, thinking that you also had uh, an experience with somebody else who's re regarded as a, a very grumpy woman uh, fanny craddock oh well i didn't have much to do with her luckily she um, <laughs> she was discovered by the daily telegraph uh -huh. she used to do these brains trusts and um, it was quite good for me because uh, men, Evelyn Garrett and some of the others would go off and I didn't have to see her. But I remember them saying, half an hour with her is like three days with anybody else. But mm. she was very, well, demanding. So her reputation is, is pretty accurate then? Very, very, very accurate. Oh, poor old Johnny, eh? Poor old Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> you see, <laughs> she was Johnny's bread and butter. Well, indeed. Yes. I mean, he, he was supposed to know about wine, and she used to bawl at him. Craddock! <laughs> <laughs> oh, we could talk all day. I'd love to, ch to chat further, but we've got to wind it up. Your blog um, uh, is brilliant. It's called despairingdelia.com. That's where you can find it on the web. But the book uh, is called The Grown-Ups Wouldn't Like It. Um, uh, it's, it's fabulous stuff. I mean, it sounds like you've made it up, but you haven't. I know you haven't. But brilliant. It's, it's a pleasure to talk to you today. I'm, I'm taking it you're quite happy now. Oh, I'm very happy. Good. Oh, I'm, I'm, well, I'm sad because my husband died in 2006. Mm. And then I had a lovely partner and he died of a brain tumour. Mm. I've been very lucky. Mm. But I'm very happy. I've got lots of very good friends and my family. So... Um, I'm very, very happy here. Oh, I'm delighted to hear it. It's a pleasure to talk to you today. Uh, go out and, and have a look at that that uh, that blog and uh, and buy the book as well. Thank you, Delia Despair. <laughs> 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 Take care. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you. All the best. Thank bye you. bye. Um, bye. T R E.